Hi, I'm Dan Matisoff with the School of Public Policy. I'm an associate professor, professor there, and I'm gonna spend most of my time talking about our new Masters of Sustainable Energy and Environmental Management program uh, and how you guys can play, play a role in that. And then if I have a little time, I'll talk a little bit about some of the research that I've been doing about the living building and how uh, we might leverage the living building to achieve and measure market transformation. Uh, so the Masters in Sustainable Energy and Environmental Management is a new one-year master's program, or one, one calendar year. Uh, it requires, uh, and, and there's a four-course certificate option that can also be used to, say, do a PhD minor. Uh, there are fellowships available due to a generous grant. We can offer five fully funded students uh, a year with stipend. It's also the tuition assistance program for those uh, staff here and, uh, and admin type folks. Uh, it is TAP approved. Uh, the structure of the program is there are two core classes. So there's a, a survey class that I've been teaching that covers the ethics and sustainability theory. Then we move into tools for sustainability management, and then we do applications through cases. Uh, then uh, there, there's a, the second required class is in economics of envir uh, environmental economics class. Uh, then we have two quantitative classes that there's a, a, a menu uh, of classes that fill that. So for example, statistics or data analytics uh, would fill those. Uh, we're hoping to add life cycle analysis and get more units uh, involved in those offerings. I think uh, environmental GIS is currently on the list as well. And then you would fill out uh, your degree with four electives uh, and or a capstone. Uh, so we're hoping to attract uh, certainly new students to the master's degree. This year we launched with about 15 full-time students and some part-time students. Uh, in addition, uh, we're hoping to attract current master's students and PhD students uh, to the certificate. Uh, for faculty, uh, we have the opportunity to add courses to the degree uh, program. We also have the opportunity to uh, make th this, this degree format is very flexible. When we went up in front of the graduate uh, committee, the, they really wanted us to push this to be a platform so that, say, you could do a civil and environmental engineering brand of the degree uh, or flavor of the degree or an earth and atmospheric sciences flavor of the degree. So if we can collect more classes, you can think about clustering a set of courses to maybe either split off a certain version of the degree, but e either way, the, the, the format here is very flexible and designed to be serve as a platform so that we can, we can add courses and add, uh, make this something that different units can take advantage of. Um, all right, so since that didn't take terribly long, I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of my research related to this building. So I've been doing uh, uh, research on uh, environmental certification programs and particularly the LEED certification program over time and looking at how LEED has uh, led to market transformation in the built environment. And so in, with this building, you know, it has a stated goal to transform the building and construction environment in the or, uh, building and construction industry in the southeast. So how are we gonna, how are we gonna measure that? How do we know if that happens? Right? And so one thing that, that, that I've done over the past years, we distributed a survey to uh, folks in the building and construction industry, including those who worked on the building, folks who didn't work on the building. We did about 20 interviews with, uh, with folks who were involved with working on the building. We've collected some stories about products uh, for uh, that the, the wrap on this building, for example, was reformulated to meet living building specifications and the company that designed that wrap decided to keep that formula, right? So they already transformed their line due to the red list associated with the living building. Uh, the steel girders that are part of the building were made without chromium-6, specifically uh, because that was uh, a on the materials red list. So we've been, uh, there's like roughly 20-ish really innovative technologies that are part of this building. Uh, we've done some baseline sampling to understand uh, what, what do people in the building and construction and energy industries know about these technologies, what's their impression of these technologies. 
We'd like going forward to follow up and, and resample over time to see how impressions of these technologies change. Uh, just in my class today, my MCM class, we read a case on the Genzyme uh, lead platinum building, which back in, when it was built in, I think, uh, to early 2000s, it was like the 11th uh, lead building or 12th lead building built in the United States, and it was you know, like a second or third lead platinum building. And it cost an extra $30 million to build at that time, just due to the uh, sustainable energy and environmental uh, technologies that went into that building. And now if you look at at least uh, the later versions of lead buildings, we don't actually think that it's that much more costly to build a lead silver or gold building. You know, this building costs roughly $600 a square foot. The previous largest living building was around $2,000 a square foot. As we disseminate these technologies, we can bring costs down, we can facilitate adoption, and that works through building supply chains, building customer awareness, reducing uncertainty associated with uh, new and innovative technologies, which that can then spur demand. Uh, so working on a book project on this right now, and, and uh, hope to touch base with you guys in a couple years.